stories in this video are entirely mine. Any resemblance to persons in worship ministry past or present is completely coincidental. I'm going to start with an analogy that may seem a little far off on the worship team, but bear with me. The office. In an office, you have a group of people working together to complete a corporate task, but in the midst of that, there can be quirks, mannerisms, and behavior at the individual level that is off-putting to the whole team. If you are the one being off-putting to the team, you need a level of self-awareness and maturity to address your quirks and assess if these are indeed problematic. Is it a personality issue where people just don't like you? Or is it a habitual issue where you can work on personal habits and change, not just for the benefit of the company, but for your own growth? I dare say this analogy applies to the worship team too, especially guitarists. Guitarists, let me level with you. We have some of the worst habits in music ministry, and I think how you respond to a situation, the first sentence that comes out of your mouth, will reveal which bad habit you have. Are you ready for some serious self-shade? Number one, I didn't listen to the song. We live in an age where our worship leaders and music directors give links to the specific arrangements of the set list through a myriad of avenues like YouTube, Spotify, Planning Center, BandLab, and we have at least one device in our possession that can play those links. There really is no excuse coming to rehearsal without listening to the song. I'm not even talking about coming to rehearsal without knowing your parts. I'm talking about being familiar with how the song sounds like from start to end. And knowing how the song sounds like at the end is as equally important as the start. So don't just listen to the first verse and chorus and count it as done and dusted. True story, my church was going to play Shekinah by Corey Asbury for the first time. I was on acoustic guitar that week and I was complacent. I looked at the chart, saw four chords and thought to myself, how hard can it be? I thought everyone was playing the song wrong because who speeds up in the middle of a song? Turns out there was a groove change to double time in the bridge. And I never knew that was there because the chart didn't indicate it. If only I just listened to the song, I would have known that there was going to be a big change. And there are many other curveballs like that. When your worship leader informs you that you'll be playing the Bethel version of This Is Amazing Grace, are you familiar with how different this version is compared to Phil Wickham's original arrangement? How about the Darlene Check versus Israel Hutton's renditions of In Jesus' Name? Stop making excuses. At least give the songs a listen once through to be familiar with the curveballs. Number two, wait for me, I'm not done yet. Picture this. Everyone is plugged in their instruments, sort out the batteries and the wireless microphones and packs, won their in-ears and is ready for the sound man to conduct his line and sound check. Except you. You're not even at your station. Where have you gone? You've taken multiple trips to and fro the car to retrieve two guitars, two amps, and now you've even asked someone from the production team to help you carry your 15-inch pedal board that weighs 50 pounds. When the sound man announces that it's time for sound check, you holler from the stage, Wait for me, I'm not done yet. You haven't even put your relevant accessories on your music stand like the e bow the spider capo, a regular capo, various picks. Stop. Just stop. You have way too much gear for a Sunday service set list of maybe five to six songs. You're not on Taylor Swift's band playing a three hour show. This gear obsession is holding up the whole team because you need your perfect tone. And in case you think I don't know what I'm talking about, I did come from a two guitar, two M giant pedal board background. I used to like the stuff every Sunday that I was rostered. Just for fun, I thought I'd try using Jam Up by Positive Grid, a cheap iRig Pro interface, and my iPhone for the Sunday service. I was anticipating feedback that the tone was subpar to what I usually brought to the table. You know what? Nobody could tell the difference. So I literally weighed the difference. 50 pounds versus one pound. If nobody was going to notice, I might as well save myself time and hassle by going with a lighter and simpler solution, either with a smaller but still functional pedal board or with software since I was running Ableton on stage anyway. Setting up takes one car trip, connecting two cables, firing up the gear and that's it. Number three, wait, what does that mean? It's time to get personal and real. You know what's incredibly frustrating as a music director? He took the time and effort to notate everything. The number of bars in interlude, the specific chord voicings, the dynamics in each and every section, all just so that's detailed enough that I can understand what's going on musically so that I can internalize it quickly. However, there are a few people, myself included, who claim to have read the chart and then proceed to play it incorrectly during rehearsal. Why didn't you repeat the interlude? I thought it was just play once. But there's a repeat sign which clearly means play this twice. Oh, I didn't know that. Why weren't you punching at the bridge? There were punches? Yes, which I notated at the side. Wait, what does that mean? I thought it was for piano, so I ignored it. Looks like it was for piano, so I ignored it. I ignored it. In any other professional non-worship team situation, this image comes to mind. 
Of course, that would be without grace and Christian love. I'm not saying everyone on the team needs an ABRSM grade 5 music theory pass in order to serve, and neither am I suggesting that anyone who can't read sheet music is any lesser of a musician. My point is that it's incredibly frustrating when a musician should know the lingo, but he doesn't. And I get it, every church has different standards when it comes to practical knowledge of music theory. The key is to find that balance. What level does your church function at musically and what level are you at with your music theory? I personally think it's our responsibility to be at a higher level of music theory and practice than what's expected at the church. That way, you're able to minimally function at the rehearsal and have some left in the tank in case of special circumstances that are beyond your control. What if you have your pastor who decided to come on stage to lead the closing song and accidentally starts half a semitone above? That actually happened to me before and our bass player who's much more musically gifted and has perfect pitch yelled the new key of the song across the stage and we were fine because our charts were written in natural numbers which doesn't need us to scramble and transpose chords on the fly. What are natural numbers in a chord chart? Ergo, we counter the solution to this problem. Go and learn! And speaking of going and doing something, hit that like button and subscribe if you're finding this video useful. It lets me know that this content is relevant and YouTube pushes it out to more people. Thank you. The last sentence that shouldn't be coming out of your mouth. Number four, I didn't realize I was doing that. This point is related to the previous points. Anecdotally, I've observed that they occur hand in hand like a freebie frustration bonus. Let me share a story to reveal this point. A long time ago, I was supposed to start the next song by myself and I needed to change the time signature from 4-4 four, four to 6-8. But I didn't listen to the music, I didn't know much music theory and I practiced even less. So I was so focused on the chord chart, trying to play the right chords. Why didn't you change to 6-8? Do you know that you were still in 4-4? Four, four? Oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. A fair moment before. Jesus, beautiful Savior, God of all majesty. This is the problem of lacking situational awareness. It's being so focused on something to the detriment of my ability to sense what else is happening around me. If I had learned and practiced a song like I was supposed to, I would be ready for the time signature change. The solution? Memorize your music. Memorizing music isn't just for professional gigging musicians. If I had memorized the music, it would be second nature to me and I would be able to focus on musical delivery and worship in the moment. I wouldn't be constantly looking down on the music stem in my chord charts trying to play catch up. In conclusion, I hope you don't use this video as a checklist to use against your fellow guitarists. That would be unchristlike and unloving. My hope is that you use it as a mirror for yourself. And I know it's not easy to be introspective and realize that these points apply to you. I'll be honest, I was talking about myself while making this video. We're all in need of improvement, some in small areas, others in big areas that require much more effort. The good thing is that we are in a Christian ministry environment where we all learn from one another and pick each other up. And while it is unlikely that chairs will be flung at us for our annoying habits, let's be honest and change for the better because our worship ministry deserves better. If you're considering skating down your gear, in this next recommended video, I share about the benefits of a laptop-based rig that is much lighter to carry and doesn't sacrifice tones. And who knows, you might finally clock in the fastest setup time on your team.